Great introduction. So my name is Yoon Nami, I'm the CTO as you said, and we are a startup based here in Oslo. So we have with me uh, down here uh, Elias who's presenting. We have a stand over there where you can uh, come talk to us later. And we are backed by a very strong team of uh, investors that have long technology background and want to build this into something uh, large. So uh, we build both uh, hardware, as you can see uh, here, custom. Um, we build software, both things that need to make the hardware run, and uh, the cloud software and machine learning uh, algorithms. Quite large for a small team. And um, the key is that we want to use sound in order to extract interesting information. Similar to how Spot can run around, this can uh, stand typically stationary on site and collect information like from them. And we use it for noise monitoring and condition monitoring. I'll talk a little bit about both. So first, noise monitoring. It's what we have worked the most on. Of course, noise is an unwanted sound as experienced by humans. Experienced very differently and so on, but that's the uh, operative definition here. Uh, so it's essentially about sound, of course you cannot have cannot have this kind of noise without sound. And um, this started in some work that was done at NMU, where I did my master's thesis after many years in the industry, where we built um, functionality to classify noise directly on the device. Because these days, uh, the standard equipment will only track you the noise level, it doesn't tell you what is uh, the noise source, and uh, which doesn't help you in identifying what, um, what do we need to do in order to improve the situation, who is responsible for improving it, and so on. So here's uh, just an example, this um, with the earlier hardware, and uh, with neural network, uh, everything uh, described in, in the thesis, um, running directly on the device. So here the, there's the computer screen, but it's just uh, displaying the output. I hope that sound will work. This is uh, children playing, it's called in this uh, Urban Sound 8K data set. And the, this is the decision boundary. And then... This is definitely a different kind of noise. This is uh, it's called anything as drilling. There's a very similar category in this data set called the jackhammer. It's going to be very hard to tell apart from the human. Um, so, you know, of course, to, to mitigate these two different noise sources, if, if someone is annoyed, or the, it will be very different in these situations. You can't do the same things, neither who is responsible, or uh, is it acceptable or not, and so on. It's very different. And so you need to know this in order to mitigate and plan proper. It's a different uh, source. Traffic is actually the biggest uh, the noise source that affects the most people in, in the world. In the world and in Europe, over 100 million people are exposed to traffic noise above the uh, limits, and over 1 million in Norway. So, oh, I we've seen that. So, one example of a use case where we put this uh, in place is Putias uh, National Velesco Center. It's uh, near uh, Ski, outside of Oslo. And uh, it's a training facility for police special forces where they train on uh, shooting and uh, Explosives, but it's also an operative base, so it had to be placed very close to Oslo center, which most people in Norway live, in order to have quick response times. So that means that it's quite close to, to people. It's 1.2 kilometers to residential areas from this location, but they selected very strategically and it's been a lot of effort to minimizing the noise impact, uh, including installing a noise uh, monitoring system from sound sensing, because they need to um, follow uh, strict regulations about uh, what time of day they can. Um, do potentially noisy activities. So they're allowed between 9 and 7 in uh, normal weekdays, and they need to document. And also if someone um, wishes to, 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 to know, they need to respond in a good manner uh, whether they created some, uh, some noise or not. And this allows them to do that automatically. And this is also uh, described uh, quite in detail at a paper at the uh, International Congress of Sound Vibration this year. So we also researched, so that, that is in the previous case was deployed, it's working, functional, and um, operational here is more of a research uh, level, it's a more tricky question, because what you're interested in is not per se the noise and activity at the site, you're interested in whether this affects the residential areas, like say the neighbors, that's what the regulations are about, and that's of course the, the 
where you want to minimize the impact. And it can be very different um, to which degree sound propagates and is heard and so on. So we uh, did research where we uh, addressed this We're using two sensors this time, instead of just one at the, one at the source and or one at the receiver. And the, the key is that you need to be able to separate the, um, when you're at the receiver, and essentially you need to separate, okay, is this noise coming from this, this site, or is it something completely different? Is it just uh, kids playing in the schoolyard, or uh, traffic noise in the area, or someone in uh, construction? Um, or does it actually originate from the source? So we do uh, independent sound event detection on each of the data streams, so at the source and the receiver, and then we merge it together in the, in the uh, cloud uh, a service to determine whether a hearable or a noticeable uh, event happened at the receiver and whether the source was active in a time close to that. Because if, if not, then it couldn't possibly have come from the source. So you can also read about that in our paper at uh, Euronoise this year. So um, yeah, on noise monitoring, so if you have a noise monitoring challenge that could benefit from this kind of automatic detection using machine learning, Please uh, get in touch. This technology, we believe, can be applied. And we are applying it to, to across many different uh, use cases. So over to uh, condition monitoring. So here, uh, we are interested in the sound not by itself, but as a valuable information source about machinery and processes. So it kind of takes a uh, uh, sort of indirect uh, interest to it. So uh, sound is a key source of information. Um, almost all mechanical uh, processes emit noise, uh, most of it in the, or quite often in the hearable range, in the human hearing, sometimes infra noise and, and, uh, and ultrasound as well. And it uh, can, is often or it can be indicative of the state of the process. So is the machine running or not? Is it, of course, a very simple uh, problem, but it's something that's relevant to track. If it's supposed to be running, you want to make sure that it is. If it's supposed to be not running, you can also track uh, things like uh, is it close to failure or is it in the failure state right now? And experienced personnel um, in a factory floor or on the production line, the process industry, and so on that are present in the area um, often use sound very either actively or uh, passively to detect issues. So, car mechanic. Well, sometimes when you, as you drive in, they, they know what you're there to talk about because they heard it in your car. Uh, and they can tell you a lot about it before you even, uh, open your mouth. Um, and this is something we can uh, replicate uh, with uh, machinery. Because uh, humans are good at this task, impressively good, but not all. So it requires experience, it requires interest, it requires uh, being present, which is actually the main thing. If the human is not there, not be able to detect the issue. And these days you want to run your production lines 24-7. Um, uh, and there are many uh, places that are inaccessible to humans. It can be physically, you might not be able to walk there and so on because it's tight spaces. Or it can be that it's uh, dangerous or harmful. So then you can use um, uh, sensors. And um, uh, this is a, also a kind of industry example that we have developed. and. Uh, is in the, in the market already, but uh, maybe not heavy asset industry. So about um, coffee bean cracking. So you might not know uh, that the coffee that you make uh, it gets roasted, or you know that. But um, so it goes from unroasted to uh, fully roasted, according to preferences, somewhere in this area. And a very good indicator of when to stop the roasting process is uh, when it starts popping, like popcorn. So the, the humidity expands and it pops. And so um, the most experienced uh, and the competition uh, uh, award-winning roasters, they actually do this by ear today. That's the, that's the current uh, state. So you wait and li uh, listen for this, and as they start to pop, then you terminate, typically a little bit longer, according to preference, uh, the process. So and we work with uh, Rust here in, uh, in Oslo. There are world leaders in, in uh, advanced uh, coffee roasting machines and they've won many awards together with the, it's not called barista, it's called something specific when you uh, make this kind of coffee. Um, so we automate this process using sound. Okay. 
put in the beans, you go into the chamber, rotate it in. Of course, it takes time. And listen carefully. There's a small uh, cracks. Now we're listening to the outside of the machine, the inside of the machine is clear. And uh, that was automatically detected by a little board that we have inside the computer with a microphone and the microprocessor. So the machine learning is all done completely on edge, integrated in, in, in this uh, device. And for the operator, it's, it's just uh, magic. You just put it in and uh, it comes out perfect every time, regardless of, for example, uncontrolled variations like humidity of the beans. Um, so uh, this can be applied and it improves consistency um, with different operators, but also um, uh, allows non-skilled operators to do it as good as the, the best in the, in the world. And what's important sometimes is you don't have to be concentrating for very intently for those 60 seconds to listen to a sound in maybe a noisy environment. It could be a cafe or an industrial setting. This actually can be very hard and it uh, wastes a lot of time because you can't do this multiple machines at the same time. So. So, that's an industrial application that we have developed, and now we are like this. Um, now we are focusing uh, more and more on this kind of condition monitoring. So we are starting pilot projects now with acoustic monitoring of technical rooms in commercial real estate. It's a complicated term, but it means the buildings in this kind of place, an office or a venue like this or a school, where you have the ventilation system, pumps, electrical systems that make this space work, that make, gives us the clean air, that gives us water and uh, in the faucet and so on. Um, so if you are um, uh, know someone in this uh, industry, this area, offices and so on, or related uh, industry cases, please uh, get in touch with us. That's uh, what I had to, to say today, thank you. We are, have a stand over there, and you please are very welcome to come and talk to us, including geekery about convolutional networks, some time series, or whatever. Yeah, sure. There's a question. So, can you talk about the data acquisition, say, for example, the coffee machine? Like, how many sound samples would it take to achieve what kind of accuracy? Oh, yes, it's a good uh, question. I can't uh, answer it super precisely because it's not purely my data. But um, we did the initial prototypes, uh, which were quite successful and, and maybe not perfect, but uh, with maybe around 10 hours of audio data. Um, this is quite long, it's like five minutes per run, and it's actually just you know one minute that is, has the sound events of interest, the rest, but the rest is also. So, um, so not, not so much. It's, it was doable for a single person to, to uh, operate and annotate. And then as we go into production, we of course want to you know, add those couple of extra percent to make it like proper, which takes 10 times as much effort. But uh, you, can start, you can start with uh, quite little. I think there is another question if we have time now. Should we wait till the end or should we have one more? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think you can get the microphone from... I can take all if you want. <laughs> Uh, uh, what about the interferences between the machinery equipment? So, for example, if the popping sound is being created by some of the internal um, equipments of the machine, so yep. will the machine just assume that this is the beans who are popping? Well, it's um, as any machine learning uh, uh, application. If you haven't told it that it's not that, it will definitely not pick it up. It will it will make the simplest solution. So, um, so for example, we did dedicated uh, data collection and testing by knocking at the machine, uh, putting another machine next to it that made the popping sound there and not inside, in order to validate and test these cases. And, uh, and uh, but it's as long as you do the proper data collection job, you can achieve good separation. But if you don't take care, yeah, it will uh, fail. Another question. Two seconds, you'll get the microphone so everyone can hear you. <laughs> the data set, from where did you get the data? And is it like continuous training for the model? Uh -huh. 
Uh, yes, good question. So uh, data is almost always use case specific, you could say. At least, at least we do validation on use case specific data. So we have some pre-trained models that can run on, that's been trained on like YouTube data, huge data sets, open, uh, open, open audio set. And, um, but as a minimum, one needs to test, okay, does this actually transfer, even though it's supposed to like, um, uh, this, they have done fire detection, but done fire detection uh, trained on YouTube data doesn't really work for our application, at least doesn't give good performance. So, so minimum is to train, take, collect the validation and a test set, um, uh, use case specific, uh, but we often end up using, uh, doing training data specific as well, because uh, domain transfer is still a very challenging task uh, in, in machine learning research, uh, it's the research level you could say, whereas Going and collecting the data, yeah, it takes time, requires effort, and so on, but it works. It's like a proven <laughs> solution, so we prefer that. Um, and we don't do continuous training. Uh, so uh, we do offline training, and that's, we want to know that we have trained a model, and we, it has a certain performance. It doesn't always require it to be like 99.9999, but we need to know that there's a consistent performance, or, uh, in scenarios, and then we would like to freeze it at that point because we, that's good enough. And then any continuous learning has a risk of uh, collapse or degrading and so on. So uh, training is this offline, and then one updates as a, as a normal product. You might upgrade it sometimes every week if it's in the cloud-based, or sometimes uh, once per year, and sometimes never if it's a hardware device that's installed somewhere. Do we have time for one more bit, or should we listen a little bit? Yes, okay. please meet us over there. Okay, Thank then you. we'll have to. <laughs> it's good to see there's a lot of interest in sound as a valuable information source. That is good. Thank you. And we all have to buy coffee from Rust so that you can continue to get his data streams. <laughs> so, we're um, getting close to the end.